What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and today we're going to be giving the Once Over to Wes Craven's Last House on the Left. There will be spoilers. Last House on the Left was released in 1972, which is 50 years ago, which is completely mind-boggling. It was directed by Wes Craven, who also directed the Scream series, Nightmare on Elm Street, The Hills Have Eyes, and a million other movies. Um, he's one of my favorite directors. I absolutely love him. And it was produced by Sean S. Cunningham, who went on to do Friday the 13th. Last House on the Left is about teenage girls Mary and her friend Phyllis, who are heading to a concert when they decide that they need to get some weed. They end up buying weed from a gang of escaped convicts who end up luring them in and murder, torture, mayhem all ensues. After the gang of convicts murders Mary and Phyllis, they end up seeking refuge in none other than the last house on the left, which happens to belong to Mary's family, the Collingwoods. The Collingwoods discover that this gang of convicts has murdered their daughter and they end up exacting their revenge. This movie kicked off a new obsession with horror in the mainstream. It was kind of Wes Craven's intent to divert from the overglorification that he thought existed in Westerns um, when it came to the subjects of death. Uh, he was feeling like this in particular in the wake of the Vietnam War, and so he wanted to create a movie that showed more realism when it came to the extremely sensitive topic of death. This led to the creation of the ultra-horrific, ultra-violent, Last House on the Left. This movie was a hit in the box office when it came out, but opinions really varied. Um, in fact, even Siskel and Ebert had completely dissenting opinions about this. Siskel thought that it was sickening tripe. They can't seriously expect us to swallow that tripe. Now is a special treat courtesy of our friends at the Meat Council. Please help yourselves to this tripe. <laughs> And he thought that it was unnecessarily violent, whereas Ebert thought that it was better than he expected it to be, and even compared it to Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring, which was a huge inspiration for Craven, and also to Sam Peckinpah's Straw Dogs. And I definitely tend to agree more with Ebert on this one. A lot of people give this movie a lot of flack for its depiction of violence and rape, uh, but I actually think that all of that violence is kind of warranted. Um, I think that this movie has kind of a feminist flair, and I think that it's important for us to look at it within the lens of showing the realism as opposed to showing the glorification when it comes to rape and other serious topics. In order to discuss why I don't think that the violence in this movie is misplaced, I think that it's important that we look at the motivations of each character. Let's start out with the motivations of the gang of convicts. So the four of them together, that would be Krug, his son Junior, Sadie, and Weasel, the four of them together have the ultimate motivation of capturing, torturing, and killing Mary and Phyllis. But each one of them individually seems to have a different motive. Krug is kind of the main bad guy. He's the evilest of the evil. Um, he is motivated completely by control. He wants to control anybody and anything that is around him. Um, of course, we know that he wants to control the captured girls, Mary and Phyllis, but in addition to that, he even wants to do things like control his cohorts. Um, he tells Sadie at one point that she is his property. In another moment in this film, Krug shows his obsession with control. He tells Phyllis to piss her pants in the ultimate act of degradation. Piss your pants. If this was Waterworld, Kevin Costner would not have let that piss go to waste. And in maybe the ultimate act of control, he ends up telling his own son, Junior, to blow his brains out, which is something that Junior obliges. Krug only wants to have control. Krug's son, Junior, also has a very obvious motivation. 
he is addicted to heroin, so his motivation is getting his next fix. Um, Krug, the bad, bad Krug, uh, got him addicted to heroin when he was a kid so that he could control Junior. We actually see a little bit that his motivation relates less to, um, you know, murder and mayhem in the sense that he's a more passive participant in the crimes of capturing and killing Mary and Phyllis. Even though he does participate, he is certainly not as active in the crimes. Sadie's motivation is a little bit more obscure. She actually says at one point that she wants to have equal representation within the group of criminals, implying that she wants to have some girls added to their gang. So it almost seems like her motivation is not actually to kill Mary and Phyllis, but to convert them into criminals so that they can participate in all of their future crimes. This begs the question, if Sadie's motivation is to just get some new friends, then why did things go so awry? I guess it's just because she's, you know, a criminal hanging out with other criminals. And finally, there is Weasel. I cannot, for the life of me, figure out what Weasel's motivation is. Um, I just, I have no idea. I'm completely baffled. If you feel like you know what his motivation is, please let me know. I'm dying of curiosity, and I just can't figure it out myself. You know, on second thought, is Weasel just motivated by sex? He brags about sex a lot throughout this movie. Um, he even says that he could make love to a woman with his hands tied behind his back, which ultimately leans to his demise. Um, but we'll talk about what happens to him later. All right, now let's talk about some of the motivations of the other characters in this film. Let's start out with Mary and Phyllis. Mary is motivated by her personal coming of age. Uh, she talks on multiple occasions with both her parents and with Phyllis about how she is excited about becoming more womanly. And she's even sexualized throughout the film at least a little bit, maybe a lot. Um, in particular, this scene of the mailman uh, lusting over her, even though he overtly says that she's 17, comes to mind. You think she's the only kid to reach the age of 17? Of course, she is about the prettiest piece I've ever seen. So basically, Mary is trying to find her place in the world as she transitions from being a girl into being a woman. Phyllis is motivated by fun. She is wild and carefree, and she is excited about life. She doesn't really want to be put into the boxes that society is creating for women, um, which was a particularly common sentiment in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Next up, let's talk about Mary's parents, the Collingwoods. The entire second half of this movie is based upon how the Collingwoods get revenge on the group of criminals after discovering that the criminals murdered their daughter. Their motivation is love. They love Mary and they would do anything for her. In fact, as soon as they discover that Mary was murdered by this gang, they don't even question that their next steps are torture and kill the criminals. Um, it's actually a pretty powerful moment because neither her mother or her father seem to second guess or question that in any way, shape, or form. They just love Mary and they want revenge. And finally, let's talk about the two characters that bring comic relief to an otherwise extremely dark movie, the cops. One of the things that we see them do is walk right by the criminal's abandoned car, which, of course, if they had identified that, they might have been able to catch the criminals. We also see that their car breaks down, so they can't catch a break there. And then finally, when they're trying to hitch a ride, they end up trying to climb onto the top of a truck, which ends up in this hilarious scene. And I'm just now realizing that pretty much every dumb thing that they do relates to cars. That's a little interesting. 
Um, they are just goofy. They're the comic relief in an otherwise dark movie. Now let's talk about feminism. And I know I'm going to lose some of you here, but I actually think that this movie is very feminist. I think that one of the best ways to look at the feminism in this film is to look at Sadie's character. I already mentioned how she kind of wants to have a girl gang join the criminal element, um, but in addition to that, she is very much seen as an equal to the men in this movie. Um, she's equally as bad, she's equally everything. She participates in the crimes just as much, um, which I think is pretty unique for films, especially of this era. In addition to that, she's actually shown in a couple of instances kind of protecting the girls. So, for example, we get this shot right here. Get your hands away, Sadie. Oh, come on, Cruz. I had her for squeeze. Where you can see that Sadie is actually covering Phyllis up from being exposed. I know that a lot of people disagree that Sadie ends up being a feminist character throughout this movie, and I think that a lot of the reason for that is because there are several different cuts of this film. Because it was so controversial and because of the violence exhibited throughout it, uh, there were a bunch of different versions depending on who would allow what to be shown. And so I do know that in some cuts, Sadie is much more of an active participant in the rapes and murders of the girls which certainly drowns her light of feminism a little bit. Uh, but I still do think that she really represents that feminist flair and that we can see that throughout the movie. Mary is another pillar of feminine power throughout this movie. Um, first off, I think it's really interesting that she uses her wiles instead of her sexuality throughout the film in order to try to escape. For example, she tries to tell Junior to escape with her by telling him that she can get him drugs. So instead of trying to lure him with, his, with her sexuality, she actually lures him with what she knows his motivation is. This is really impressive because we know that her sexuality is burgeoning, so you might think that she would rely on that, but instead she uses her smarts. Mary also stands up to her parents quite a bit in this film. When she tells her parents that her and Phyllis are going to be seeing the band Bloodlust, her parents kind of give her a little bit of grief about this, and she really stands up to them. In addition to that, she stands up to her parents when they tell her that her nipples are at full attention, and she says that not only will she not cover them up, but in addition to that, the only solution to her nipples being out would be to sandpaper them off, since they're just normal human anatomy. This is a super, super huge stance of power, and I absolutely love it. And finally, towards the end of the film, when the Collingwoods are taking their revenge on the criminals, Mary's mom, Mrs. Collingwood, commits the ultimate act of demasculization. She bites off Weasel's dick. Oh, sweet mama. Here I come. Ah! All in all, this movie does a really great job of showcasing the extreme female power that women can possess and how they do possess it. Besides the fact that people are really split on if this movie is feminist or not, there are a lot of ways that there are huge contrasts throughout the film. I already talked a little bit about the bumbling cops and their goofiness versus the extreme violence that we are seeing throughout. Um, but I also want to talk about the music. Um, the music in this movie is almost more like it should be in a Jim Henson film than it should be in a horror movie. And this really shocked people. I mean, it was like nothing that had ever happened before. This huge juxtaposition kind of gives us an idea that sometimes we have to disconnect from what we're seeing. And I, I, I wonder if Wes Craven was kind of going for that. In fact, one of the things that makes this movie so harrowing is that people like Krug and the gang really do exist. I think it's particularly terrifying that this movie has no masked killer. We are confronting the horror head on. David Hess, who plays Krug, creates one of the most vile characters that we've ever seen on film. So the audience has to confront the evil, sickening ways of the world, really, throughout this film. Additionally, the movie just ends after the Collingwoods kill the gang. There's no time for survivor's relief or survivor's remorse. 
we just get revenge done. We don't get to know about their future. We don't get to know about how this impacts them. And that kind of terrifies me to my core. This movie really blurred the lines between what makes a good horror movie, and it also laid the groundwork for the 1980s slasher films that were to come. Not only is it an incredible movie in and of itself, but the way that it inspired the future of an entire genre should not be overlooked. And with that being said, I'm going to rate this movie. I love this movie. It is one of my all-time favorite horror movies, and I absolutely would give this a 7 out of 7 thumbs up.